вечер, уважаемые коллеги. Спасибо всем, кто сегодня сквозь эти ужасные пробки добрался до нас. Я в начале нашего выступления хотел бы предоставить слово представителю Министерства юстиции Российской Федерации Александре Владимировне Усачевой, которая обратится с приветственным словом к участникам нашего семинара, учитывая, что это первый семинар в серии наших семинаров под общим названием Modern Arbitration Life. Мы очень рады, что коллеги из Министерства юстиции поприветствуют участников этого семинара. I will repeat in English. Um, dear colleagues, uh, we are very happy to uh, see all of our guests uh, here this evening. Uh, and uh, with a welcoming um, word, uh, address, uh, we would like um, to ask uh, the representatives of the Ministry of Justice of Russia, Ms. Alexandra Usachova, uh, to address to the audience and to the participants of this uh, first seminar uh, in the series, I hope, of this seminar's Modern Arbitration Life. Александра, Спасибо большое, слово. Андрей. Uh, уважаемые коллеги, uh, спасибо большое за так ли блестящую возможность вообще uh, побывать в, в принципе в библиотеке исследовательского центра. Uh, спасибо большое за вообще такой интерес к арбитражу. Мы, как такое министерство, которое ведем активную работу по реформированию арбитража, нам как бы кажется, что вот такое движение проведения семинаров очень важно, потому что мы для себя ставим задачу как раз развития арбитража и наиболее как бы, оценку и продвижение лучших практик. И вот проводя реформу, мы сталкиваемся с тем, что да, мы вот уже как бы ну, какую-то часть ее провели, а что дальше? И мне кажется, что вот какие-то новые тенденции мы можем выявить в ходе таких семинаров, и нам очень ценен опыт, который будет представлен здесь как со стороны Востока, так и со стороны Запада. Такие, такая арбитражная ось будет построена, и мне кажется, что вот это будет очень ценно, как для участников семинара, так и для, собственно, регулирующего органа. Поэтому спасибо большое за приглашение, Андрей. Вот. Ну и желаем участникам удачи да, и получения каких-то новых знаний. Спасибо большое, Александра. Uh, now we switch in English, uh, because uh, as working language today we have English. Uh, so I would like to welcome all of you uh, at our uh, Modern Arbitration Life discussion that will be dedicated to third-party funding, uh, mostly in arbitration, but I think we'll talk a little bit about litigation too. Uh, first of all, I would like to, th uh, to say thank you very much to the International and Comparative Law Research Center, which hosts this event in its, uh, uh, I think, unique uh, library. Uh, I hope that you will have a chance uh, to look to the um, uh, great uh, collection of books that they have. Uh, we would also like to, th to say thank you to Legal Forum Academy, um, a pa partner of this event. And uh, thank you very much uh, to our special partner for this event, uh, Hong Kong International Arbitration Center. And uh, we are happy to welcome here uh, representatives of uh, Hong Kong International Center. Um, uh, Sarah Grimmer, who is the Secretary General uh, here also. Uh, and now I would like to introduce our speakers today. Um, we have uh, Chan Bao uh, on right hand from me, a counsel at Scott and Arp Slate Megger and Flom Law Firm, uh, Hong Kong office, and the former Secretary General of HKIC. Um, HKIC, uh, during her tenure, was recognized as one of the most popular venues in arbitration, and in 2015, uh, by the International Arbitration Survey, uh, as the most uh, um, Uh, as the most frequently used arbitral institution outside of Europe and the most improved institution and the third best arbitral institution worldwide. Um, next speaker is Joe Liu. Uh, Joe is active managing counsel at HKIC. Uh, Joe uh, supervise, supervises the administration of arbitrations and other disputes resol resolution proceedings uh, in HKIC in English and Chinese. Uh, before joining HKIC, Joe worked as a registered foreign lawyer at a leading international law firm in Hong Kong, 
So uh, we will have, uh, I think, both perspective uh, from the institution and from the practicing lawyer uh, um, from Joe, and there's a practicing lawyer and from former representatives of uh, institution from Chian. So I think it's a unique opportunity. Uh, we have also a guest from London, Michael Redman, director and co-head of Burford's Global Corporate Intelligence, Asset Tracing and Enforcement Business. Uh, he has worked in complex asset recovery and enforcement um, uh, proceedings for over a decade, uh, holding positions, uh, senior positions both in Moscow and in London. Uh, as far as I understand, uh, Michael speaks uh, Russian too. And uh, then um, uh, he became a shareholder at the leading asset recovery boutique called Focus. Uh, so he has worked on many enforcement actions. Uh, in different asset tracing issues and recoveries. And um, uh, Michael represents actually the funder, uh, without whom the third party funding uh, would be impossible. Uh, on the left side from me, we have uh, our Russian speakers um, from Moscow. Uh, Yuri Babichev, head of group of international arbitration, cross-border litigation and shareholder disputes. Uh, before joining Goldblatt BLP, uh, Yuri worked at Cleary Gottlieb Stian Hamilton Law Firm for 10 years. Uh, he received a degree in LLM from Columbia Law School. Uh, and Yuri is qualified to practice law in the Russian Federation and admitted uh, to the bar in the state of New York. And uh, last but not the least, we have... Um, our speaker, uh, Maxim Karpov, who is the um, managing partner of National Legal Finance Group. He is PhD and has a uh, large experience as a businessman investor. Uh, so we have a representative uh, uh, of the uh, Russian uh, funders here, uh, the starting initiative. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we have Russian uh, funders, and on the right-hand right side, we have uh, English funders. I, I will also add, oh, what a mic. Um, by the way, we want to demonstrate our team spirit in NLF group, so my partner, Viktor Yusefovich, is on the way. So we will probably switch sides, and I will join you, and uh, he will join this perfect board. So, uh, so soon. Okay, so then let's move to our topic. Uh, actually, uh, the idea behind the Modern Arbitration Live seminars was to discuss at each seminar the... Uh, hot topic uh, in arbitration, comparative uh, law uh, uh, perspective, uh, and we have chosen third-party funding as a very hot topic here. Maybe for colleagues it's not so hot, because I think um, uh, in, in the UK and in Hong Kong maybe it's already uh, being much discussed, but here it's um, uh, very uh, very new, and uh, so these initiatives are only starting, and uh, we would like to look um, how, how it works, and um, actually how it works in uh, both uh, uh, Western jurisdictions and in Eastern jurisdictions, uh, uh, how the uh, regulation was discussed, uh, for example, in Hong Kong, because in, uh, in June, as far as I understand, in Hong Kong was introduced the special regulation for third-party funding. Uh, so before uh, actually moving to our speakers, I would like to give some small background of third-party funding, and uh, I would like to start with the definition of third-party funding. Uh, so, uh, actually, before s talking about definition, I would like to say that uh, there are many definitions of third-party funding because there are different third-party funding arrangements. And uh, there are not only one uh, definition. Uh, there are different definitions in different sources in different jurisdictions. That's why even uh, I would show you there was uh, recently issued the draft report for public discussion that was prepared by ICCA and Queen Mary University of London on third-party funding. So it's a very large document which is dedicated totally to the third-party funding. And uh, I have chosen the definition that is suggested uh, in this report. Um, so first of all, uh, when we talk about third-party funding, we mean the funder. And who is the funder? It's a natural or legal, legal person who is not a party to a dispute, so who is not a claimant or not a defendant, uh, but who enters into an agreement either with a disputing party, so with the claimant or respondent, or with affiliate of that party, 
uh, or a law firm that represents that party. So it's the funder. Uh, second element, why does the funder enter into this relationship with, uh, with the party or with the affiliate or with the law firm? Uh, so he enters into this relationship in order to provide material support or to finance part or all of the costs of the proceedings, either individually or as part of a selected range of cases. So it can be uh, support of the exact cases or it may be a series of cases or a big conflict involved in different disputes. Uh, but the core issue is that the funder provides uh, financing and support for the proceedings. Uh, when the claimant or defendant, usually it's the claimant we we'll talk about it, doesn't have enough funds to hire lawyers and pay costs for the proceedings. Uh, and the third element of third party funding is that such support or financing is provided either through a donation or grant or in return for remuneration or reimbursement wholly or partially dependent on the outcome of the dispute. So uh, the funder provides the money, uh, uh, not claiming it back, as far as I understand, we talk about it, uh, and he expects to receive some uh, profit uh, from the outcome of the dispute. So if the claimant wins, so then the funder will be entitled to part of, this, uh, of the winning sum. So this is the basic notion. I think that uh, maybe some of the speakers will say that it uh, uh, doesn't cover all the situations. It's not uh, appropriate. So I think we'll discuss. It's interesting. And uh, a few words about how we want to structure our discussion. So uh, at first, I would like to address uh, with some general issues, like jurisdictions, how they look into TPF, forms of TPF and approaches. Uh, then I would like to talk about funders' perspective, asking questions from uh, Michael and Maxim uh, mostly. Uh, then counsel's perspective, I think I would ask, like to ask questions Chian as the representative of councils. Uh, then arbitral institutions where Joe uh, from HKIC will uh, tell his uh, views on this issue and maybe I would try to comment also as the representative of Russian arbitral institution. And then we have some concluding remarks, uh, and I suppose that uh, we can have questions and answers during the discussion. They are rather welcome, so we have the, um, the microphone, and I think we can ask the questions during the discussion within this, this, this structure. So moving to the uh, uh, general issues, uh, I would like um, to address first, uh, I think, Michael. Uh, and um, to ask a few questions, because as far as I understand, uh, um, uh, the, the, the third party funding, TPF, uh, was initially, in 16th century, was prohibited, I think, in, uh, due to some court practice, these concepts of maintenance and champerty, who prohibited third party funding. But then, uh, I think, uh, during the 20th century, third party funding became more popular in Australia, in the UK, in the United States, and now we see that this popularity goes to Europe and to East, to Singapore, to Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, so, can you tell a few words about the actually the history, maybe of this, about uh, your fund when this business started, actually, and um, to tell a few words about um, actually the. Uh, the essence of this business. So what is the difference between third party funding and contingency fee, for example? Uh, what is more popular, litigation funding, or arbitration funding? If we talk about arbitration funding, whether it's more popular in commercial arbitration or in investment arbitration? Um, is it only for claimants, or you have cases where you fund uh, uh, defendants? And um, which types of cases, in your opinion, are most appropriate for, for third party funding? So maybe too much. Yeah, sure, sure. It's, 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 it's just an idea. So, but uh, I encourage all speakers also to help uh, and to uh, be free to comment. Yeah, there's a lot of questions there. So I'll, I'll try and run through them. If I miss one, then uh, let me know. Um, you're right in that champerty, parity, and maintenance was outlawed for a very long time, um, all over the world. But England, I suppose, first and foremost, because it was an English concept. You know, what it boils down to, champion and maintenance, there's no reason anyone should really know the definition, but it's profiting from someone else's legal case. And the origin was really feudal England, um, you know, feudal lords funding each other's case to, to either get land or something else which wasn't related to the, uh, to the legal case itself. And so it is a very old concept that had really passed its time. So it was the, the funding industry, the professional funding industry, 
in England is only about 10 years old. Um, so it's, it's a young um, profession. It's, it's a young business in, in many ways, and it's, and it's developing year by year, month by month. Um, so we're f you know, very much you're seeing what we kind of refer to as the second wave of, of litigation funding. And I use the term litigation funding, but it also covers arbitration funding, and I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, you know, the first phase being this is a new thing, this is a concept that people need to get comfortable with, and now you're seeing, I suppose, after the early adopters of funding, you're seeing new markets open up, you're seeing, you know, the Asian markets open up, you're seeing this market really opening up, um, as well as many other different types of funding or finance being used um, in across legal services, and it's not just litigation. So it's, it's a diverse... Um, Thing, and that's where it does cause some, I suppose, definition problems. Um, and I can come back to that. So that's kind of where we are. And when we talk about funders, as you say, legal natural persons providing capital for, for legal cases. But, you know, there are many different types of structures, many different types of people providing this kind of finance. You'll find that some companies are listed. Um, so their, their capital structures are a mixture of equity and debt. Some of them are private funds, um, either onshore or predominantly offshore. So they have, you know, subscription agreements with their investors where they can call up capital if they find the right case. And sometimes you find individuals, you know, high net worth individuals wanting to take a, take a punt, um, you know, do, so, do an investment in this space, take the risk because the great attraction to it as an investment is that it is not correlated to the financial markets. Um, it's purely about the case. So, you know, whether the markets are going up or going down, whatever else, you know, the case is the case. Um, the, the fundamental basis of litigation funding, however, and this is why it's risky and this is why it's, you know, seen as expensive, is that we, um, it's non-recourse lending. So we don't take security over people's houses, we don't take security over people's companies, we don't take equity, all that kind of stuff. If the case loses, we lose our money full stop. Um, so we are taking a big risk on all these kind of cases. Um, it started out really in the litigation space. Um, it's broadened out to, to arbitration and other types of legal proceedings. Um, and that's all over the world. You know, you'll find that most what I would call mainstream litigation funders, um, of which there are perhaps 10 uh, between London, um, the US, and a, a few dotted elsewhere, um, you know, they have a, they have a preference um, based on their personal backgrounds for investing in cases that they understand. Um, so you'll find that a lot of the, the English litigation funders will invest purely in common law jurisdictions because they're familiar with the issues, they understand the law. Um, there are very few, or there were very few until a few years ago, litigation funders who had experience of civil law systems. That's starting to change. Um, and so, you know, there is a greater diversity, I think, in, in the business, and that's both kind of the scope, the breadth of, of where we invest, as well as the, the types of cases we invest in, the types of money that we put out. Um, you know, it's no longer just the, the top end of things, the most expensive cases. It's also very small cases. And that kind of reflects the people coming to us as well. It was the case that when the business started out um, close to 10 years ago, most people who came to us came to us because they needed to come to us. They needed money. Things are very different now. Um, we find large corporations who can pay for their legal costs coming to us purely to displace the risk because they don't want these things on their books um, on any given year. Because if, if you think about it from a corporation's point of view, what they are doing is, if absent funding, they are incurring an ongoing cost uh, that they have to account for in their books. Potentially, you know, that's, that's taxable, whatever else. Um, but they are not accruing any kind of income related to that expenditure. If and when the case goes their way, then that's not a repeatable item. That's not something they can book as income, therefore. So it tends to go below the line. So it's benefit neutral from them. It's, it's pure expense. And so you'll find that more and more corporates come to us um, because they want funding, not because they need it. And I think that's how it's continuing to, to change. Um, litigation arbitration, I suppose. Um, I think probably still the, the greater volume is, is still litigation. Um, as opposed to arbitration, but we, we and, the, and the business invest in, in both types of cases. I think the, the only thing that really differs, obviously, we have to take into account the cost-shifting environment of litigation in a common law jurisdiction. 
um, and we take into account the, the cost of arbitration and the relative costs thereof, which is a controversial topic, but um, individual um, arbitration cases can be the most expensive um, one-off investments that we undertake. Um, you know, they are long duration, they're expensive, and um, they're, they carry all the risks that come with litigation, um, but they incur costs nevertheless, so we view them very much as the same kind of investment, the same kind of risks, we just have to be comfortable with the underlying case as ever. Michael, uh, and just one more question um, in this general section. Uh, so, and what about defendants? So, do you have uh, clients defendants? Or um, only claimants? Defendants are, are difficult. Um, and I think when the, when the industry cracks defense funding, you'll see that a lot of the criticisms of the business start to disappear because our greatest critics obviously are defense side, um, as you might expect, our respondent side. What is difficult about funding defense cases on the respondent side is obviously it's difficult to define the upside of these cases going away or them going well, and that's where we live. We live in the, in the margin, the upside of, of these kind of cases. That's where we get our profit. Um, and I, we, there are very few corporations who are, I think, willing to see reduce cost or early settlement um, as, a, as a benefit incur some kind of success for your profit for us. Yeah, but uh, if the defendant uh, has a counterclaim, you would think that, that that's maybe the story. Maybe you can elaborate on the type of claims uh, a funder would be willing to, to consider and support. Most professional funders will, you know, I suppose, invest across a broad spectrum of cases. Well, what they tend not to, we tend not to invest in is individual cases. Um, where there isn't, I, I suppose you put it as, as, as a rational claimant who is capable of making a, a rational commercial decision. So it tends to be in the commercial world that we, that we live and breathe. Um, it's everything from you know, high court litigation in, in England through to exit cases against state respondents, um, where you're dealing with you know, issues of jurisdiction, you're dealing with issues of sovereign immunity and everything else that kind of comes with it. Uh, most of the claims when you have the money at the end, so that's the, the monetary claims. Yeah. What are claims like, I don't know, for, for property, for shares in companies, for, uh, I don't know, pieces of, like, for land plots, those kind of things. So uh, it's not exactly the money at the stake, but property of other value. That is less frequent, but, um, but I think because the, the industry is changing, because it is becoming more competitive, we are looking at different types of cases as they come up, because there is demand for it. I think legal costs are legal costs, irrespective of whether it's litigation, arbitration, or you know, anything else that, that might cross your desk. It's, it's something which is investable, um, and there is a definite commercial um, financial benefit to it. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Michael, you said that um, uh, it's mostly uh, litigation, uh, so, uh, but arbitration too. Uh, but so in Hong Kong, uh, as far as I understand, uh, the TPF was uh, introduced only for arbitration. And uh, as far as I understand, I would like to address this question to Joe. When you were discussing uh, the possibility to, uh, to introduce uh, TPF, so you have uh, looked into other jurisdictions. And I wanted to ask, uh, uh, from your uh, point of view, which jurisdictions are most uh, TPF friendly, which are not, uh, whether you have looked only in common law jurisdictions, as Hong Kong is common law jurisdictions, or you have looked also into some um, uh, civil law jurisdictions. And uh, I also would like to ask you, if possible, what's in your opinion the best way to regulate TPF? Is it legislation or its guidelines? or with some other form of, uh, I don't know, rules of arbitral institutions, because uh, we know the examples of Singapore and Hong Kong who introduced legislation, uh, but we know also that, for example, in Paris there was official uh, uh, position of National Council of Advocates, uh, of attorneys. Uh, so can you please tell about, about what you have studied during your work in Hong Kong? Point of a clarification, um, the third-party funding regime in Hong Kong applies not only just to arbitration proceedings, but also to associated proceedings. For example, arbitration-related mediation proceedings and arbitration-related litigation proceedings. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, the different approaches um, of different jurisdictions, so there is no uniform approach that has been taken um, 
across the globe. Um, but I have identified four main approaches. Um, I think the first approach is to expressly recognize the use of third party funding for both litigation and arbitration. Um, and it, those jurisdictions include England and Wales, Australia, and some US states. And the second approach is um, to recognize the use of third party funding for arbitration um, and associated proceedings such as Hong Kong and Singapore. Um, the third approach um, is, is that some jurisdictions simply don't have any legislation or case law that deal with this issue. Um, and uh, third party funding remains a very unregulated um, market. Um, and, but that, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't do it. Um, in those markets, um, some third party funded, fund funders continue to provide services, continue to fund cases uh, in those jurisdictions and even without express um, uh, statutory regime. And for example, I think France is one of those examples, uh, Germany, um, in mainland China, although it's extremely rare for third party funding to um, provide funding in cases in mainland China. And I think that's also possibly the case uh, in Russia as well. I understand that there is no legislation or case law that expressly deals with the subject of third party funding. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, there are cases that is um, that, has, that have received financial assistance in, in some forms. Um, the last approach is, is to prohibit um, third party funding. Um, one example is Ireland. Um, um, there is a recent um, uh, case decided by the Supreme Court of Ireland um, that expressly stated that third party funding is unlawful. Um, that violates um, the common law doctrine of uh, maintenance and champity. So I think these are the sort of four major approaches uh, I have identified. Um, in terms of um, what is the best way to regulate it, and I think it is a, it's a very difficult question, um, um, and I think there is a merit uh, in different approaches. Um, I don't think there is a general consensus in that regard, but uh, there is a general consensus that third party funding should be regulated. Um, in the 2014-15 uh, uh, Queen Mary survey, 71% uh, of the respondents uh, have indicated a desire um, for third-party funding um, to be regulated. And one of the questions asked in the report, or in the survey, was that what is the uh, most effective way to regulate third-party funding? And 58% of respondents indicated that uh, they prefer regulation through guidelines such as IPA guidelines. 29% um, um, prefer a regulation through collective self-regulation, such as a um, code of conduct issued by an independent body, such as um, the Association of Litigation Funders in the UK. <clears throat> and 6% uh, um, prefer um, individual self-regulation through um, internal, internal bylaws um, by each um, third party funder, for example. Um, so in Hong Kong, I think the approach is a combination of regulation through statute and code of uh, practice. Um, what has been um, proposed uh, or will be, uh, what has been proposed in the amendment bill in Hong Kong is that um, the arbitration ordinance will be amended to include the express provisions um, on disclosure of third party funding arrangement um, and, and, and as well as the extent of such disclosure and the timing of such disclosure. And uh, there will also be amendment to the confidentiality provision of the arbitration ordinance to allow parties to disclose confidential information to potential uh, and existing third party funder. But in addition to that, the Secretary for Justice of Hong Kong will also appoint an authorized body to issue a, a, code, a set of a code of practice, code of conduct, that will set out um, practices and standards um, for third party funders um, to operate in Hong Kong. And um, the, the code of a practice will include, um, for example, um, how third party funder should promote itself in Hong Kong and what are the key terms that should be included in uh, the funding agreement, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, Hong Kong takes a slightly different approach. So it's a combination of statute, reg uh, statutory regulation um, um, and also regulation through a, a code of, a, code of a, a 
practice. So that doesn't quite directly answer your question, what is the best practice, but uh, uh, I thought it would be at least useful to set up different approaches that have been taken by different jurisdictions. Uh, so before moving to more specific questions, which I have to all the uh, speakers today, uh, do you have any questions or someone would like to comment? Maybe some uh, questions, yeah. Michael, if I'm not mistaken, uh, You've said that uh, at the beginning of uh, your business, Burford was uh, dealing with the people who really needed money, and uh, the situation now is different. So uh, you like more like an insurance uh, for those who want to get rid of the risks, uh, which are attached to the litigation process and so on. So how do you cooperate? If it's true, how do you cooperate with insurance com companies? In, in some ways, we're very symbiotic, I guess, with the insurance industry. We rely on them quite a lot to um, underwrite the risks that we face of adverse costs in, in England, for example, or in a usual cost-shifting environment. Because if we're paying the, the claimant's costs, um, and we're also having to stump up things like security for cost at the outset, fortification, then we want that fund to, or those funds to be insured um, mm -hmm. as a way of protecting ourselves more than, more than anything else. Um, but there are, there are cases out there, um, very good cases, that are funded, in inverted commas, by insurance companies and insurance companies alone. And this is, again, where we get into the slight problem of, of definitions because they're not treated as litigation funders, mm -hmm. but they are invested in the outcome of litigation and arbitration. Um, and so whatever regulation you would have put in place potentially wouldn't cover insurance companies because they wouldn't be treated for as, as litigation funders for disclosure purposes, for capital adequacy purposes, and, and whatever else. And the same is true very much of a, of a high net worth individual who is investing in these cases. They wouldn't be treated as a funder. So I think, to bring that back around to, to the question about regulation, I think it's what we find a little bit um, perverse in some ways is imposing a regulation that's purely defined by the fact that this is what we do for a living. Whereas if you dabble, then you're not covered by the regulation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, just to follow up on uh, Maxim's question. Uh, so in terms of the insurance, uh, I, I understand that the, the London market uh, for the insurance, um, such a product is available so that if the claimant is lose the case, so he may also order to pay the uh, attorney's fees of the defendant, and you can take after the fact insurance. The already, case already started, and uh, the insurance company is out. Like they provide insurance coverage for that particular risk so that you pay the other size lawyer's fees. And is this something which Barford would also include its in investment? So that's something, those kind of a costs of paying the insurance premium would be uh, offered to, to potential claimants. So not just the legal fees, but the insurance premiums. Yeah, well. very much so. I mean, that's very much you know, a factor of life in a cost-shifting environment. And I, when people come to us or you know, corporations come to us, they want us to pick up the tab whatever the tab looks like, pretty much. So we'll pay for, for lawyers' fees, court fees, and we'll pick up the tab for when, you know, after the event insurance premium or, or whatever else. And that's the key difference, I suppose, in terms of the product. Um, because insurance, you have to stump up for and pay premium at the outset. Um, and that's the, the price for them not looking as deeply, I suppose, into the merits of the case. They view it in terms of a, a volume risk that they assume rather than an individual case that they want to, to invest in. In that kind of way. But, but do you have a kind of a ratio of amount of money you're prepared to invest in the case to the particular return, so like the amount at stake? I know that some of the funds, they have this kind of a 1 to 10 ratio. So they're willing to, if the case is for $10 million, they will not exp provide expense, like cover expenses over the $1 million. Yeah, I, I think the 1 to 10 ratio is pretty, pretty standard across the industry. And, and the reason for that is there's enough room in that for the funder to get out with its money back and, and some profit, ideally, for the, the clients to walk away with some money. I, th I think when it, you're looking at, you know, a lower margin beneath that, it's, it's very likely that someone's going to walk away sad because there's two things that we can rely on, that the damages won't be what they should be and that the budget is never kept to. So, you know, if, you're, if the margins are pretty tough at the outset, then you're going to eat very much into and everyone else's positive outcome in that way. 
Thank you. Uh, I think we have a question. One first here, uh, colleague. My name is Kirill Mladik. I, I teach in the High School of Economics, University at the Law School. Uh, first of all, thank you for organizing committee for uh, for organizing so nice conference. I'm, I'm, I, I participate for the first day. It was really amazing uh, conversation yesterday, and, and I hope that uh, today it will be a very nice talk, talk as well. Uh, my uh, uh, question is to our Hong Kong colleague uh, Chan, and my question is related to limits of disclosure of, of disclosure of information about contracts and, uh, contracts and the enforcement to. Uh, Potential uh, potential funders. Uh, uh, I understand that uh, maybe in practice there is very no um, negotiations about co potential funding with five or ten uh, potential funders. But imagine that if we negotiate uh, at the same time uh, about potential funding with five or ten or fifteen or uh, 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 potential funders. Does it mean that we really can uh, disclose to all of them without any limits information about contacts or uh, about contacts which will be um, uh, 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 which, which, was, which was a base for dispute? Uh, without any, uh, to any amount but of potential funds and without any limits, without any restrictions, or oh, in reality some limits of disclosure exist? If I understand the question, yeah. the question is as to what... I think, I think the question is basically what are the limits for disclosure yeah. which the uh, client come to the lawyer and then the lawyer said, well, you, there is a third party funding available. So what is the limit of disclosure which the client provides to the third party funder? I think the answer would be, like, it depends on the stage. The question, if you approach several funders, which is net, like which is the sophisticated clients do nowadays, is that do they disclose everything? Or the, because they are, if it is an arbitration, there will be an underlying contract in place and there will be a con duty of confidentiality both under the contract and under the arbitration. So how this is usually handled? Right. I, mean, that's the question. I think certainly this touches on um, later part of our yeah. session, but um, um, in short, um, certainly there are local issues as to privilege and the limits of your disclosure are um, confined within those types of parameters. Um, but indeed, if you do have, I mean, certainly when you are going out to the funders in the first instance, um, there are certain aspects that you don't want to disclose, especially if you're going to a whole range of funders and certainly you would want some preliminary confidentiality agreements put into place. Um, but then secondly, there are um, privilege issues that you have to deal with and certainly you would want to seek local advice in Hong Kong. There are privilege, um, there is something called common interest privilege and so you would be able to kind of have access to that within the context of you know going out and seeking funding um, in those types of circumstances. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question. Yeah. Thank you. Artem Dudko, Widen Case, London. Uh, also a question about information, but slightly different angle. Uh, in London, although third party funding has been there for some time, it's still a hot topic, so don't worry about that. But uh, we're, we're, we're struggling with some, some, some quite specific questions now, and one of those is confidentiality and conflicts. So uh, if, Andre, if you showed the slide originally where you said as to funder can reach out to the party, an affiliate or a law firm, and suddenly there's, there's someone involved in the case who has a financial interest in its outcome. The question is, and there's, there's a lot of answers to it, and I'd like to hear the views of the panel, as to should the identity of the funders be disclosed, and at what stage and to what extent the information should be provided? Well, I think we, we, we wanted to address uh, these issues uh, at a little bit uh, later stage, but I think that we can discuss it as, as it will give some, uh, uh, I think, interesting points to, to the discussion. So, uh, I don't know, who was that? I would also say that who we should be the recipients of that disclosure. Yes. That, that's an, was an important question. Okay. I think potentially that's the most yeah. important part of that question, because the, the issue that disclosure is trying to get over is, is conflict of interest and uh, where that comes from obviously is someone on the tribunal sitting as an advisor to a litigation funder or more of a, the litigation funder in the case. Um, so that 
should be gotten over. That's, that is an issue and that you know, is a very live issue when it comes to enforcement or potential challenges of the seed and all, all the rest of it. Um, but I, I fail to see why that information should be shared with anyone beyond the tribunal, as in the other side. Like, I, I think they need to be comfortable with the, the fact that their fellow tribunal members aren't sitting on boards and, and whatever else, and they need to be satisfied that it is a professional funder, but um, my personal view is that that's as far as it should go. Yeah, I agree with that. I think once an arbitration has been commenced, I, I do think that uh, the, the preferable view is that the identity of the third party funder should be disclosed um, primarily for conflict check um, purposes. And that is the, also the approach that has been taken um, under the Hong Kong Arbitration Amendment Bill. Um, so, um, and uh, if, if you have already entered into a third party funding arrangement um, on or before the commencement of the arbitration, the identity of the third party funder, as well as the existence of the third party funding arrangement um, must be disclosed on the commencement of the arbitration. And if you enter into um, a third party funding agreement after the arbitration has been commenced, you must disclose um, the identity of the funder and existence of the arrangement within 15 days after the date um, of entry into that uh, agreement. I think this is actually quite um, an important point. I mean, it's, it, there is some controversy surrounding it, but certainly this is where institutions can play a meaningful role because obviously conflicts of interest um, in relation to the arbitrators is one of the key areas where there can be some regulation by the, um, the arbitral institutions. And you'll see some of the amendments made in ex um, arbitration institutional rules and also the HKIC um, proposed amendments do address this particular area in terms of um, disclosure of the existence of a funding arrangement as well as the funder itself. Um, there are certainly increased number of arbitration practitioners turned funders slash arbitrators who are on these investment boards and certainly there is some risk. I mean certainly it's not a great risk at the moment but certainly um, foreseeing in the future as to the growth of this industry there is certainly um, scope for um, risk of these types of conflicts. Thank you colleagues. Uh, Sarah, yeah, I have a question. Thank you very much Sarah Grimma, HKIAC. I have a question for Michael. Maybe the answer is it depends. Do you, in your experience, um, do you see a difference in predictability of outcome as between litigation and arbitration and for the time being carving out investor state arbitration? Um, you know, I think there are certainly statistics about certain types of arbitration being more respondent friendly than others. Um, what we tend to find, I think, with that when it comes to the stats is that it's almost cone-shaped inverted cone because once you get over the issues of jurisdiction then it's a bit more evenly weighted. So the unhelpful answer is that it depends um, and I think that's both in arbitration and, and litigation. I think the thing that skews the, the predictability of these things or I suppose the investability of these things is what's at stake and over what duration. So we're willing to take as an industry um, all types of risks when it comes to either litigation or arbitration. But if you're, if you're taking the same risk over a five-year period, that's inherently more risky for your capital than it is if you do it over a two-year period. Um, and, and those are the things we, we take into account. And obviously, if you're risking you know, the house um, on a very big, very expensive case, then that does skew the risk analysis from our point of view as opposed to a, a, a medium-sized case over which we have some site of control um, over, over spend along the way. Can I ask a follow-up question to that, um, which is the difference between um, availability of information between litigation and arbitration. Obviously, in litigation, you see all the outcome in the judgments, and whereas in arbitration, you don't. And so do you have big data information to give you better predictability in terms of outcome and types of cases in relation to litigation versus arbitration, where, I mean, maybe the best, most predictable um, data point would be the arbitrators that you appoint and, you know, their background and, you know, what their views are in papers? Um, it would be very cool if we had big data capabilities. Um, for the moment, we don't. I, I think the, these kind of cases are still relying on individual underwriters assessing the case, assessing the people working on the case and coming to an informed opinion about it. 
the industry, I think, will go down that route of big data eventually. You know, whether you know, we probably have the the largest set of information on our books, um, just about the number of cases crossing our desk, the you know the huge number that we turn down, the small number that we that we take up, and and the kind of the stuff that falls out of that. But we have not yet crunched that to the to the extent where I think we have any kind of predictability, and certainly not the you know an algorithm or anything else that would be predictive of, of the outcomes in, the, in these kind of cases. You find that there are, the industry is moving that way, but it's moving that way um, at a very low level, I guess, with particularly US litigation, where you can have all this kind of information available in terms of both suit size, judge on the case, outcome. It, it's all very clear, all very transparent, so you can model that. Um, and there are some people who do it purely on that kind of basis. If, it, if the algorithm's happy, then it's a good investment. Um, it's very hard to do to contemplate that in the arbitration world, I think. So I think that, that kind of answers the question about how the individual assessment of the case goes on, uh, whether to take it on board or not. But how is the portfolio is formed? Because it's, it's, it's litigation funding, but it's also an investment activity. Because I myself, how it is compared to a private equity fund or to a hedge fund? Portfolio, do you say? Yes. Yeah. So how do you, how do, you do it? Um, Individual cases are, you know, are what they are, and, and we view them kind of in the round. But when you're looking at a portfolio, um, either with a client or with a law firm, it's a slightly more palatable risk in some ways because you're spreading your risk. Um, as long as it's cross-collateralized in, in that kind of way, then you're going to get your capital back from something that works out as long as you're happy with, with the spread of, of cases or matters that, that are involved in the, in the portfolio. I think the thing that might skew that and the thing that we have to be very conscious of when we're assessing portfolio opportunities is adverse selection. So if they do have 15 cases, we'll see the, the five really bad ones and we'll keep the 10 good ones for themselves because they know they're going to work out or more likely than not to, to work out. Um, and that's just you know the, the soft element of our business where we get to know the, the lawyers on the case or the client on, on the cases and you know get to trust them or not. Um, and get to trust that they're being forthcoming with us about the good cases, the bad cases, and the marginal ones. Um, because portfolios are probably the best way of, of handling truly marginal cases. Um, sometimes bad cases, more likely marginal, but um, it's only with that kind of spread that you can do it. Uh, when you have that kind of diversity. Do, of do you form some kind of a sub portfolios? It's like this is a sub fund specialized in, in, in arbitra investment arbitrations where you have the longest horizon. It's like it may go for four or five, six years, it for recovery 10 years. And uh, I don't know, like a fast track claims which can go for one or two years. And, and, and then the, on the probability, those kind of things. Is it, it depends on, on the capital structure of the, of the funder. So some people will raise money to invest in a particular type of case over a particular duration, and they'll have a very specific mandate about um, what they can invest in. Uh, for, for listed companies like us, we have a bit more flexibility, but it's very much you know the capital structure determines um, the, the mandate or mandates that they have across those kind of portfolios. Well, thank you very much. These business issues are very interesting, Yuri. If you want to make your own third-party funding business, I think you will have the chance to ask Michael how to settle, arrange all this stuff. I'm, I'm I will not. That's why I'm asking now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I would like to switch uh, back to some more uh, obvious issues. All the said when you have case, so it's it's really obvious. But so let's imagine I have a, a potential claim, and so I come to you. I don't know anything about third-party funding. I don't just heard about it from uh, modern arbitration life um, uh, flyer. And uh, so how do how will you look into my case? So actually, what your activities will be to assess to make due diligence of my case, how the results of this assessment uh, would influence the third-party funding fee arrangement, so the rate, uh, the sum of money, so uh, uh, what will be our agreement in regard of the, of the money, so the most interesting thing for me. Um, if you look at, I suppose, how people come to us, you know, we either get approached by law firms, we get approached by corporates, and we get approached by brokers. Um, and there are certainly in London, you know, that's small number, three or four of established brokers whose job it is to act as the, the go-between to package up some of these cases and to bring them to the funding market uh, in order to get the best deal for their client. You know, that comes at a cost primarily to the, uh, to the funder, but you know, that market exists. And the, the approach oftentimes is dictated by who approaches us. So, you know, the, the broker will be looking to 
maximize certain aspects of the case, particularly the potential damages, particularly the potential investment, um, because that's how they see their remuneration um, figured out of the case. It's, sometimes it's on money deployed, sometimes it's on profit or perceived profit on the case or the potential profit on the case. Um, but corporates and lawyers tend to view things in different ways. Sometimes corporates will have a very different spin on a case when they approach it straight off. Um, it will be less legalistic in nature um, and obviously lawyers will come to us with, hopefully, um, very in-depth analysis of the, the merits or at least a ballpark view of this is the cause of action, this is the defendant, this is um, you know, the, the counterparty. And when we look at the cases, obviously there's, there's many things that we, that we assess in the course of conducting our assessment. The merits are the obvious big one, but there are other things such as if we win this case, even if we do win this case, can we collect the money from, from the other side? Um, is it solvent? Is it in a jurisdiction that will recognize our award if and when we get it? Um, or are we going to have a potential five-year battle enforcing this thing on the back, on the back of a five-year um, case in the first place? And also, inevitably, it comes down to a lot of the, the personalities involved. So we will assess the case partly based on who's bringing it to us, um, whether we see them as honest brokers, straightforward to deal with, and more of a forthcoming about information about the case and their situation. Um, and we'll assess, obviously, the law firm that's, that's attached to it. Um, we're not in the business of taking on cases and dispensing with the law firm um, and putting our own preferred lawyers in place. We view it very much as a package. So we have turned down what we think are good cases because there are bad law firms attached to it or bad lawyers are good law firms attached to it. We just don't have confidence in their ability to, to maximize the value in the case and, and, you know, and, and in short, to, to win it. Um, but that's very much, I, th I think, part of inevitably our, our counterparty risk. Um, you know, law, lawyers and law firms that we have had a good experience of dealing with, we will time and time again give preference to them because we know that they have a good track record of, of us and they have a good track record of, of dealing with, with funding. Um, and that goes a long way for our ability to, you know, to come to a sensible deal with them and not be taken to the mat every time about a, a novel clause because it's not the first time we've seen it, which is quite nice. Thank you. So, uh, for example, I have a, a $100 million claim in LCIA. Okay. <laughs> you haven't heard about my lawyers yet. <laughs> it's a deal. So, I have $100 million, uh, yes, and I have, uh, I have these lawyers from Widen Case. Uh, very good lawyers. Uh, so, what will be, what the amount of money that I shall give you in the end, so when we finally win? Um, that depends, and, and like I say, the risk for us is, is partly about the merits of the case, um, partly about the duration that our money is put to work, um, and, and partly about the, you know, the volume of, of capital that we are deploying on any one case. And so we'll put those three things together, um, come up with a, a unique, I suppose bespoke is a horrible word, but a bespoke um, price for, for that particular case. Um, and we'll see what is, what is possible, because oftentimes these things end up being a negotiation, and where we would like to get in terms of pricing is not often where we end up. It's, it's an opening gambit based, you know, based on all these things. And so sometimes I, I think you know, there has probably been in the last 10 years a, a perception that's been built up that the typical funding model is the greater of three times their investment or 30% of, of the proceeds. And that certainly was the case, but that probably was the case about five years ago. Um, so we are looking at different pricing models now, and it may be that it's a percentage of, of the, the back end, so the ultimate damages that are, that are recovered. Um, it may be a multiple or an interest rate based on what we are investing, and it may be an increasing um, multiple of, of our investment. And sometimes you know, you'll find that you do get pricing which, um, which is designed to reward early settlement because most cases that we are presented with will be settling overnight. We are, we are you know, confidently informed. So we will structure products that um, get more expensive with time, duration, and the amount of capital that's put out. So it's, it's playing to, you know, somewhat to, to our concerns and our areas of risk. Okay, and can you tell me to fire these guys and to fire the guys from BLP? Uh, we won't do that. We'd rather turn down the case than 
dictate who should be involved in it. I think, you know, if nothing else, it's, it's bad for business. Word gets out pretty quickly if you do that kind of thing. Are there funders that do that? Um, I haven't actually heard a credible story of a funder doing that. Um, I think they take the same view that commercially it's, it's not great. Um, it may be that they whisper in the client's ear down the road and try and convince them to you know, move elsewhere, but I haven't heard of a funder coming in and displacing a law firm that way. Would you simply turn it down or would you express your sort of like a suggestion or preference to the client say, you know, we have a preference for this law firm, but ultimately it's your decision? Would you Typically we turn it down um, without the explanation. We, we don't think that that's helpful. That's kind of displacing them by the, by the back door. Um, I think there's so many questions associated with it because it seems so tempting to be able to, yeah. I appreciate that, I mean, it's a reputation on the line, but it's certainly like if you can create your, your ideal, your A team for a really good claim. Yeah, and there is, you know, I, I think I have heard of, of some funders having, you know, a preferred quasi-panel of, of firms that they tend to go to. Um, that I'm not sure how realistic that is. I'm not sure either how, how true that is. But I think probably what you do find is that there are certain relationships that funders have successfully with individual lawyers or individual law firms, and they will funnel as much cash to them as humanly possible. Um, so the funding industry typically doesn't look for you know diversity or scale. They don't want to fund everyone in the market. They want to fund good people in the market doing this kind of stuff. Partly because it's more profitable, and partly because it's it's probably better for the industry. You, know, you can rely on the cases they bring to you. They act as very good filters at, at the outset, so it's more likely that you will see good cases because they know what that looks like. Um, they're just more experienced in seeing, bringing good cases and weeding out the bad ones. So it's probably a self-selecting group of people that tend to get their cases funded more than anything else. Okay, so I didn't get uh, an answer to the question about my 100 million. Uh, so, but uh, by the way, it's specialized broker because if I want to look for another funder, so it's uh, or they do some different brokerage. Uh, typically, they they f broke for the funding industry as well as for the insurance industry. Ah, okay. So, you know, you go to them okay. if you want AT insurance okay. or you know default insurance on your subordinated. Okay. Debt then I will go to to Russia. So uh, I have this still 100 million US dollar claim. Uh, so, actually, Maxim, who are you? Actually, you're a broker, you're a funder. Uh, well, so, how you assess uh, the claims? How you can help me? Well, actually, we were really inspired by the model uh, and the, the success story of Buffett. So, we actually the same but Russian model for Buffett. So, uh, what we do, we invest our own money. And uh, probably we're at the stage where Buffett was uh, about 10 years ago, so at the beginning of uh, the whole industry. So, but what I see is that uh, the logic is almost the same. So I, I would subscribe on, uh, I, I would put my signature on all of what uh, Michael said. It's actually the same scoring approach. So we, uh, we treat it, uh, I have some experience in the venture industry and in investment. So I'm a professional investor for 15 years. Uh, not actually uh, all uh, was uh, regarded uh, to low cases, but uh, it's, uh, I invested in uh, real estate, I invested in venture projects. So uh, the, uh, the business model, what we uh, make is actually very similar to the business model of investment fund, of venture fund, because there are typical risks, uh, and the, the best way to, to mitigate them is to create the diversified portfolio of uh, the project. So, uh, and in order to try and to answer your question, so what, what would we do with a case with a 100 million? I would say it depends. <laughs> as, as usual, it depends on the risks which we uh, perceive in this project, on the terms and the period which we think uh, would take to settle this uh, claim and uh, of course uh, uh, the, the next execution of this claim. So it's very important for Russia. I will say, Michael at the beginning said that, uh, that is, uh, this industry is not correlated with the market risk. But in Russia it's, it's almost the same but it's still different, a little bit. So w what we see that uh, t taking a one year and a half period for a usual uh, litigation process. At the end of the process, at the beginning, you, you can be very sure that 
for instance, a very large Russian bank would be a very good triple A payer of this debt. But uh, strange things happen, and uh, one year passed, and this bank is bankrupt. So actually, uh, you couldn't even imagine that, uh, well, you've made a very good uh, due deal of uh, this claim, and uh, you've, the legal situation was perfect, but uh, there are still uh, market risks in this. But they, of course, I agree that uh, they are not correlated, that in general, it's, uh, this industry is not correlated to the market risk uh, of the gold hardware. So, but the, the question, of course, we need detail in order to uh, make you uh, an offer. So without detail, it's, it's like uh, asking how much is the price of the car? I would say what kind of car? So let me help you as a lawyer. <laughs> the case is walking around, BLP is here to help you. <laughs> okay. uh, <laughs> but not so close, <laughs> not at the moment. So um, I, I will approach on your behalf and explain. So, this is a pretty good case. Uh, we have over 60% chances of winning. Uh, at the moment, as things stand, uh, the respondent is a solid bulletproof bank, as you explained. Let's call it like a from top 10 in, uh, at, at, the Russian, at the Russian list. Uh, we anticipate that the duration of the arbitration will be around two years. Mm -hmm. And our fees will be in the range of uh, three or four million dollars. Well, I think this is ready to suggest lower price. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see. <laughs> and, and, and just to make the deal strike, we are prepared to cap at uh, four and a half million. So, mm -hmm. like, we estimate lower, but if you need a cap, four and a half. Is it something becoming more interesting? What are the yeah, pieces of information? That's almost uh, the perfect figures. Uh, uh, so, uh, at least I can... Uh, and not a price tag for him. If How I, much it will cost him? Uh, <laughs> um, well, uh, with these figures, uh, if I was uh, a math mathematician and not the lawyer, I would make an easy calculation. But I need time, but, uh, well, it probably, if we are taking Russian case and we will change, for instance, dollars into rubles, then uh, we would uh, want, with a 60% probability, we would want, we would want, three and a half. Well, so about uh, <laughs> maybe 20, we shall wait for Victor for your partner. Twenty to thirty percent of uh, of the amount of, of the amount of, of, of the claim. Twenty thirty so million. Okay. Twenty to thirty percent <laughs> yeah. of the amount itself. Yeah, One hundred yeah. million rubles. Yeah. Yeah, great thing. So uh, actually, well, that you said that uh, you should consider. So you did perfectly well yourself. But uh, I understand that that the team is working. So you're bringing me to another question, uh, to Michael and also to you. So whom you have in your team? So you have lawyers, you have uh, experienced uh, litigators, you have maybe some uh, forensic, uh, some uh, people who, who look investigators. Um, and uh, another question uh, that is more interesting, whether you can handle the case yourself, whether your lawyers maybe can represent me in LCIA, not to hire these guys who are very expensive. Um, yeah, so we, and I think most um, funds, funders are, are made up of former lawyers um, of, you know, typically they've been attached to work at leading litigation firms, they've worked on arbitration cases, litigation cases, all the rest of it. Um, and we have bankers, former bankers. So I think that's increasingly the way that we have gone a little bit in terms of diversifying the view so that we view um, cases, portfolios, clients, relationships more in terms of of finance rather than pure law. Um, and that's purely for diversity's sake. And I think some of the, because of the, some of the complexity of, of the cases and portfolios we're putting together, but on the whole, um, you know, funders are made up of, of lawyers, but not practicing lawyers. And that's where we get into not doing this ourselves. So you won't find a funder taking on the case and really having um, control of the case um, during the merits stage of, of the case. It, differs somewhat if you're looking at um, enforcement work where you don't have issues of championing maintenance and some of the issues of control of the case somewhat disappear, but at the, at the merit stage, we won't handle the case. We'll in, be entirely reliant on the law firm and the client to, uh, to handle the case, which is why we are selective about the lawyers that we work with because we're putting you know, our money where their mouth is um, very much. 
and, and we're reliant on, on their good work. So we might look over their shoulder, but we, we our approach to this stuff is as a passive portfolio manager rather than an active case manager. Okay, thank you. I'm asking you the question because if you look into, if I'm correct, uh, into uh, Hong Kong legislation, and it's a question for our uh, guests from Hong Kong, I see that uh, there is special provision that says, however, third-party funding of arbitration does not include the provision of arbitration funding directly or indirectly by a person practicing law or providing legal services, whether in Hong Kong or elsewhere. So I'd like to ask what was behind this idea of this provision. So it's uh, the first uh, attempt uh, or the first main issue to avoid this conflict of interest issues, or it's something else? John, maybe, <laughs> can you, please? Um, I can't really speak to really the yeah. official thinking behind it, um, but I, I think that that has something to do with um, the long-standing prohibition of contingency fee arrangement under Hong Kong law. And um, and I think I understand that that is the issue that will be dealt with separately by the different regulatory authority. And probably the, the, the legislative council when mm, reviewing this bill thought that, that this is not the appropriate forum to, to deal with that expressly in the third party funding amendment bill. Um, so that's my understanding as to why this provision sort of, um, uh, that's how it came about. Uh, I don't know whether you Yeah, to. I mean, I would echo that, and I think it's actually um, somewhat unfortunate that this language was added um, fairly last minute, um, but I think that it does bring clarity to the issue as to contingency fees, mm -hmm. um, which, exi which is prohibited both in Hong Kong and in Singapore, and in fact, I think it does allow for the third party funding industry for arbitration to, to do even better in a jurisdiction where contingency fees are um, not allowed. Um, but that is a separate matter, I think, that um, um, hopefully will be dealt with in time. Okay, thank you. So I would clarify uh, that contingency fees is kind of fee arrangement when the law firm agrees to represent uh, the client uh, in prospect of receiving some amount of money in the future. And I think it's allowed in the US, but it's uh, prohibited in in, in your jurisdictions, uh, like Hong Kong and Singapore. Okay, so let's then move to uh, to council's perspective, and uh, let's imagine that I have this claim already filed, and the defendant, which is Bulletproof Bank, uh, has um, uh, uh, suggested me to enter into a settlement, uh, for example, and suggest me 50 million uh, instead of 100 million. And so the question is how to tackle the conflict of interest between the council uh, and the funder, because uh, the, the council is between the funder who provides funds uh, and who can tell, no, no, we shall not agree for 50 million, it's too, too low, and the, the client who actually is okay with 50 million, so it's better to have it than nothing. Uh, so, uh, Chan, what's uh, your perspective how to, to deal with this uh, uh, situation when uh, when the council is between these two two sides actually within one. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is more this is directly to the issue as to control, um, and another area of controversy in relation to third party funders and their relationship to the case. Um, certainly, um, these types of issues should be dealt with at an earlier stage and certainly um, the funding arrangement or any terms and conditions associated with it should probably address in, um, any issues associated with settlements. But certainly this is the crux of it. And I mean, I would look to the funders to see, you know, how they address this particular issue. I mean, there are various stages in which um, conflicts of interest may arise um, and control may be at issue in relation to, for example, um, the, strat the overall strategy or monitoring the case or appointment of arbitrators. There are certain specific um, responsibilities that um, a funder may be interested in having a say in, and I think settlement, fund settlement agreements is, is at the heart of it. So, I mean, I would almost punt it to a funder to see like how they would deal with it other than um, address it early on and manage expectations through the funding arrangement itself. Okay, Michael. Yeah, I think the, the issue of control is probably at its sharpest when it comes to settlement authority. Um, that's always 
one of the first issues that people kind of bring up as something they're concerned about when entering into a, a third party uh, funding agreement. Um, and you know, the, the short answer is that we don't have settlement authority. We will provide a view and we will provide a different view in often, often times uh, compared with the, with the lawyer who will take a view on, on the merits. And we're viewing things partly on the merits and partly through you know, the prism of our, our investment and partly through the prism of what is economically sensible in the situation. Um, partly based on our experience, partly based on the numbers we see before them. You know, so it's a more of an Excel spreadsheet form of view, more than anything else. But it's no more than that. So our recourse, if, um, if they don't agree with our assessment about the case and we think that they're acting unreasonably, is to pull the plug in our agreement. And that means losing our, all of our capital, and it means us getting out of, out of the agreement. We don't really have any, any recourse against the client in that case, and we don't really have any recourse to, you know, to force through a, a settlement um, at that point. And so that's often where it's sharpest and, and riskiest. Uh, thank you. Just one more question uh, to, to Michael and to Chian. So how do usually funders and councils interact with each other? So uh, is it possible to ask the council uh, to report directly to the funder? or the council will refuse such kind of arrangement, for example? Um, in terms of reporting, there are probably separate reporting lines. So there's the, the line of instruction, which is always from the client, and there's the line of just keeping us informed, which is typically from, from council to, to us. Um, not cutting out the client, but the reason they've come to us very often is they don't want to be involved in the day-to-day -day management financially of the case. Uh, they're relying on their lawyers to do the legal part. They're relying on us to do the financial management part. Um, so they're happy for, for them to be excluded oftentimes out of that conversation, but um, you know, oftentimes we're the, the next call. So they will tell their client, the counsel will tell their client um, what's happening in the case, uh, the new developments in the case, and the next call is to us. I've heard of funders um, interested in asking for um, daily transcripts of the hearing. Is that something that is common mm. or... It's, it's pretty common, yeah. So in the actual hearing itself, you know, oftentimes these transcripts are, are made um, and, and we ask for copies of it, I think, you know, just in the, in the regular course, just to keep ourselves informed. Whether they get read or not is a separate question, um, but we get them. Okay, Russian colleagues, do you have any comments on this? Uh, I think, like, in terms of uh, potential conflicts of interest uh, in the relationship between the funder, the lawyer, and the client, the practical situations may be very difficult, but I think the, the general guidelines, at least for the lawyers, remain the same. Uh, we owe, as lawyers, our professional duties to the client. He's in the driving seat. Uh, if he tells us, like, to pursue the litigation, we will pursue that. If you want to settle, we'll settle. And um, <clears throat> the funder is maybe unhappy, um, and but, but we, we should a still exercise our independent professional judgment because the, our views on the case may be different from the views of the funder and the lawyers who advise the funder. That's true. And uh, sometimes I, I, I haven't, haven't come across this in the funding situation, but uh, sometimes the lawyers of a co-defendant and their views on the case may, may have some influence on my judgment because I may foresee some issue, they may see something which we doesn't obvious to me. So the, the, as a practical matter, I suppose there is some collaboration and things, but when it's getting, I think the, 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 the really hard situation is that the one with the settlement. And uh, because for, for, the, uh, for the funder, it's only about the money. Uh, for the client, it's in many situations more than just the money. And they still may want to continue to litigate. Uh, and uh, the question then happens if our fees are fully paid by the funder, and uh, but we owe our duties to the client, and the funder walks away. So you know, because I, that's maybe something you can elaborate, uh, Michael. Because I, I'm not, I don't f fully know what are those kind of a rules. What are the standard clauses when you can walk away from from the deal and say I I I, I stop funding, because that that's the most New evidence is brought to because. Matter. Yeah, I, I hope, I actually don't know the answer to this question, but that's a very difficult one. When I really have the client uh, who cannot afford to pay, it's a different situation if he, if he can't afford paying himself and he's just doing to spread the risk. That, that's usually a different thing. But if we have the client who cannot pay himself and, and I as a lawyer have to continue representing him, but the fund, I'm not paid anymore. 
That's uh, something which, which is a difficult thing. Is it possible? I will stay alone <laughs> with my claim. So I'll, uh, I will try and chat. You're very popular. Um, thank you very much. Try that one. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's a difficult situation, particularly that one. I think it does put council in, in a difficult spot. But um, the points at which we can withdraw from an arrangement we have with a client is typically if they have held something back, something which has you know, materially altered the, the footing of the case um, from when we assessed the case at the outset. Typically that's, you know, a, a new piece of evidence that they knew about and didn't provide us. I haven't seen that happen. I'm not sure whether it has happened. Um, but there's that and also the, the catch-all of acting unreasonably in the conduct of the case. So either they don't accept your advice, um, your advice as counsel, um, or they don't act in such a way as to make our investment financially viable. Um, and that's, you know, they want 100% of damages plus um, interest plus, you know, blood money plus whatever else. That's, you know, irrationally, unreasonably from, from our perspective. Um, and so in that kind of situation, we would withdraw, let's say. Um, but as you say, you would still have your your obligation to represent your client or not based on, on your, your own professional um, ethical obligations. I will have such an unreasonable client that will look for my for the exit for myself as well. It Very may not be that just yeah. the, uh, the like that I'm no longer paid, but there may be something else uh, for me to work. If, if the client acts against my advice, that may be also a trigger for me to terminate the relationship. Yeah, I, th I think in such a scenario it would be very straightforward. I think to see a situation where um, um, where you would have to withdraw because you're not you know able to make the representations that you your client wants you to make. A question, a related one. So we spoke about the conflicts. The question is about the privilege because uh, it's, it's a notion which is not so kind of uh, popular in Russia because we don't have these disclosure things. Uh, so in one respect, privilege under Russian law is absolute. On the other, people don't think about it like they, people think in England, in America, or in common law jurisdictions. So in a sense, whatever the information I exchange with my client, so information he provides to me uh, seeking advice is confidential and would cut it for the privilege. And my advice to him, so the memorandum I write and email I send to him, is covered by privilege. But if I give it away to some third party, that's potentially a waiver of the privilege. And uh, the, the guys on the other side, the adversaries, they may try to get that kind of information. If they got to know that there is a funder there, and some advice was provided, and during the arbitration, the document disclosure phase, although the, it's usual exception that I will not provide you anything which is covered by privilege, and they would respond, well, you waived it, you, you showed it to your third party funder. And therefore the question is, do, as a practical matter, those uh, common interest privilege no, uh, rules and, and clauses are introduced in the contracts between the funders and, and the clients? Yeah, it's very much in, enshrined in our agreements that it is covered by both legal privilege and common interest privilege. Um, and the place where this has been tested in our favor, um, that funders are covered by common interest privilege, is Delaware, more often than not. And there is a, you know, a, a good weight of cases now coming out of the U.S. that um, the privilege is maintained and not waived by providing information about the case to a, to a funder. It's just for the benefit of the audience. The, the common interest privilege is in the sense that uh, it's kind of a a carve out to the exception. So if you disclose to a third party, you, you waive your privilege, but if you do it in a, to a party with whom you share the common interest, who has the same interest with you in a the dispute, then it's not a waiver. And I think, I think that reflects in this principles you, you just mentioned, that the, the report which was uh, published in September on the study of the third party funded in arbitration, they also suggested that a disclosure of, uh, of information to, to the third party funder shall not constitute a waiver of privilege which I think that's, that that's, this should be the, the, the common agreement among the practitioners. Yeah, just to add to that, um, and referring back to that, um, the, the, the survey or the task force report, um, they do deal with, as you mentioned, the legal, the, the legal privilege, common interest privilege, and it is something very specific jurisdic jurisdiction by jurisdiction. I mean, it certainly, um, English courts and the U.S. courts have very different 
um, views and on, on the scope of privilege. Um, and um, on the other hand, when you're talking about the waiver of privilege, you're not necessarily looking at a court by court or jurisdiction by jurisdiction issue, but rather if it does go before the tribunal, according to this um, report, um, which refers to the IBA rules of taking of evidence, where 9-2 um, rules al allow for the tribunal to um, decline to order production or decline to like deal with the privilege issue on grounds of commercial or technical confidential confidentiality that the tribunal determines to be compelling. And so there are some fairness points associated with whether to waive the privilege or allow it to stand. Um, you also mentioned it in the context of, you, you said that it doesn't apply to Russia, and certainly that's a huge area that, at least in our part of the world, China doesn't have that kind of privilege. Um, it's a very common law principle. Um, and so the question is, if there's no privilege, is everything disclosable? Um, but the reality is that because you're in a civil law jurisdiction where dis discovery is not as broad as it is in the common law jurisdictions, actually you, it might not ever rise to the occasion of knowing that you need to be seeking for this kind of information. Obviously institutional rules that now require um, disclosure of funding arrangement and exist the funding arrangement and the existence of a funder may prompt um, the other party to then ask for that kind of information, but as a fun, as a, a, a basic matter, there isn't necessarily the opportunity to to even engage in that kind of discovery. Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, I, I I think we enjoy each other very much, and I think, uh, but I know that we have interesting questions from from the audience. Uh, Artem, can you please ask uh, about the proceedings? Yeah, how it goes. Uh, Michael, I think probably to you once again, and uh, apologies for all these questions, but it's a great opportunity to ask them. Um, you've discussed that a lot of cases now, people are just looking to manage cash flow, but there are those instances where someone has a really good case but has no money at all. The problem is for them to get the initial funding requires in effort and funding from or finances from somewhere, at least to do the initial checks, find out a is the case any good? Who, who pays for it? And what are the instances when a funder would cover those costs? Um, that, I think, remains pretty tough. I mean, if you talk about the criticisms of, of the industry, it's that the money is very expensive, and it's expensive to get funding in the first place. Uh, and that is a, a legitimate issue that I think people face at the early stages of, of a case. Um, and we have, I think, as an industry, not yet cracked that scenario where... Um, we cover some of the costs or we're able to cover some of the costs. I think oftentimes, and it does depend on who the, the, the funded party approaches, um, there are varying levels of, of costs incurred because I, I think where you might have a private fund, potentially one whose sole business line isn't litigation funding, um, you might find that they put more of the, the burden on the, the claimant in the first place to, to acquire, you know, a silks view about the merits, you know, put the documents together, put the bundle together, put a, you know, the procedural timetable together and, and everything else. But I suppose companies, someone like us, where the burden of diligence in the case sits more with us, um, maybe some of those costs can be reduced, but I wouldn't expect them to be reduced to, to zero. I think the industry may go down the route of, um, I suppose, recouping some of those sunk costs, typically out of the, what we would call the back end, so, you know, most funders will look at a case and say, we will fund from the point that we're happy to, to put money out um, from that point forward. We typically don't do prior costs, whether that's putting the case together or whatever else, but I think some cases may merit um, consideration of um, paying some of those sunk costs as, a, as a, either a first or a second priority. So perhaps we get our capital back, and then perhaps then the claimant gets their sunk cost back, and then maybe we get our profit. But um, very few funders are willing to count as that. I think it probably has to be a very good case uh, for, for that to, to be operative, I think. But then you've got horse and cart. You know, how, how do you get to that point of assessing that it's a, a good enough case to, to make that kind of structure work? I'm not sure. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we have another question. Sarah? Um, 
a mock trial constructed by the funder for the funder? Or? Um, in an arbitration format, we have seen that less often um, for, for whatever reason. I think it's hard to, to mock that out to a degree. We, we see it more often in a US context, particularly at the Apple level, where you, know, you can moot the case um, a little bit um, more as a funder and see how, these, how the, our trial counsel will perform under pressure addressing some of these issues. Um, but in an arbitration context, not, not often. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, by the way, speaking about mock arbitration, I, I thought about moot arbitration. Uh, I know that uh, this year there is moot problem uh, that is very popular also in Russia. This competition uh, concerns third party funding and I hope that we will have some questions from the uh, students because I know we have here uh, participants of moot court uh, with moot. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, oh, we have the question already. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so I had a question which relates to this year mood problem. Uh, first of all, the question is um, how deeply third party funders are involved in the conduct of a proceeding, so how deeply third party funders influence with the decisions uh, which are made by the party, which they fund, for, and more specific within this question is like how actively third party funders participate in appointment of arbitrators. And the related question is, uh, do the third party funding can create um, the justifiable doubts regarding the arbitrator's impartiality? For example, if the arbitrator was appointed several times by the party who was funded by the same third party funder, uh, can this create justifiable doubts? And uh, if yes, uh, why? Is it because third party funders can influence not only the conduct of the arbitration but also the outcome of a case, or it's not relevant at all? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I, I would like to add to, to this question a little bit because I wanted to ask also Chian and uh, Michael and also my Russian colleagues. So, yes, when, when I will have finally the award, how third party funding can actually affect the enforcement uh, in. Uh, in some of the jurisdictions. Uh, so I think this question also addressed to this point. So please. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about control previously, yeah. and I, I suspect that's where um, the, the traditional London model, if you want to call it that, differs somewhat from the Russian model. I imagine the Russian funders are and would be less constrained to exercise control over the case. Um, Maybe that's a good thing, maybe that's a bad thing, I don't know, but I, I, the typical main, mainstream English model is that we don't get involved. Um, we are passive providers of capital, in inverted commas. That's why our agreements stand up to scrutiny. They're able to survive disclosure um, and don't cause problems either for the claimants or for the case itself. Um, but that's you know, a, a common law issue that we face that we kind of abide by. In terms of um, the, the viability, I suppose, or the, the operative nature of the, the awards that arise from cases that are funded, uh, I think I'm right in saying jump in, but I, I think we have yet to see a case that has been overturned because of the influence of a third party funder anywhere in the world. Um, it's thrown out um, quite often, and it's thrown out um, quite often in terms of you know, pure conflict of interest, that this arbitrator has you know, been appointed uh, more often than not by a third party funder, or he might sit on the board of the alleged or actual third party funder, and all the rest of it, that actually hasn't happened. But um, it's more the perception, more than the reality that I think people are aware of and try and exploit, um, rather than you know, an actual problem that leads to enforcement issues or you know, awards being overturned. I think that's right, isn't it? I, sh I should know this, but I feel like the IBA rules of conflict of interest have kind of dealt with yeah. third party funder as in a similar kind of way as counsel in terms of the number of times that, you know, Third part. I, I mean, if it hasn't, it should do because that seems to be the appropriate place where that kind of issue might be addressed. The purely in a moot context. I'm not saying that this is you know policy or whatever else, but I would be interested to know a lot of the, the chat around conflicts of interest centers around the funder itself, whether it's disclosed, whatever else. But no one says that um, an arbitrator on a panel can't have outside commercial interest if he's going to be you know on on the short list. And I think maybe that's something that people could look at. So if you sit as an arbitrator, you can't have outside commercial interest, be they sit on the board of a third party funder or any other company for that matter, they're professional arbitrators. Um, 
no one's really addressed that. So, you know, in a moot context purely, that might be quite an interesting issue to, to bring out. And I think that institutional rules have not addressed it fully in that regard. Um, certainly they require the disclosure of funders, but um, arbitrators, at least, it's not consistent as to whether disclosure is required of arbitrators in terms of their connection with the party. Um, but there is some encouragement to do so, um, but I don't think it's expressed in like a final, um, there isn't a final view on, on the arbitrator's, um, the arbitrator's um, disclosure in terms of their funder relationship. Um, I would think also that any, fun, any arbitrator who is on an investment board or whatever would have the proper, um, proper um, infrastructure in place to preclude them from being engaged with anything that may raise, rise to the level of conflict. Yeah, and you can imagine the, the funder itself, if, if it saw a conflict on the horizon, it would affect our investment yeah. more than anything else. So yeah. I think we'd step in very quickly and say yeah. this is an issue yeah. we either have yeah. to Don't get over, address, or drop. So. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think, uh, just to add, I think uh, as you pointed out earlier, sometimes um, mm -hmm. justifiable doubts as to impartiality or independence is not about actual bias, it's also about apparent bias. Yeah. It's, a, it's a perception issue. So I think that, um, and, and obviously it depends on the circumstance of each case, but I think the fact that if an arbitrator, um, particularly presiding arbitrator or sole arbitrator is sitting on the investment committee of a funder that is funding one of the parties, that, that's, that does raise a bit of a red flag, uh, even though there is a proper Chinese war, for example, in yeah. place. Um, um, and, and, and there's no conclusive view as to sort of whether or not um, that would definitely give rise to just about that file without or not, what is the institutional decision on that. But I think uh, that does, I think uh, if you're applying sort of the reasonable possibility of bias test, that does um, make some institution, at, at least appointing the authority, a bit nervous. I think also in relation to the point that whether or not a repeated appointment uh, of an arbitrator by parties funded by the same third party funder will give rise to justifiable doubts as to impartiality or independence. Again, I think also depends on what exactly is the arrangement, um, sort of uh, <coughs> the, the, the extent to which the third party funding has influence um, on the appointment of the arbitrators. At least um, when we are considering a challenge to an arbitrator on the HKIC rules, we're not bound by any IBA guidelines um, on conflict of interest. And that is an important reference point for us to look into, but we are not just bound by the number of appointments. Um, you know, it's not, it's not about the figures. Um, we also look at within what period of time um, those appointments were made, and also look at the structure um, of the uh, third party funding arrangement, if that information is available as to whether or not the arbitrator chosen by the party was actually influenced by the third party funder. So I think there are a lot of factual points that we need to take into account in deciding on that kind of challenge. You had asked about the enforcement point yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, just to kind of raise that or mention that briefly um, in the context of disclosure, um, whether an arbitration award would not be um, enforced due to the failure to disclose a third party funder. Um, I don't think that that has been tested yet, um, but it does seem to me and we've referred to institutional ro rules playing a role in the disclosure element is that certainly while it might not rise to the level of non-enforcement, there would likely or there may be some sanctions in place if the party um, is re required to disclose a funder or the, a funding arrangement but um, fails to do so. So I think that there, in the context of arbitral institutional rules, there may be um, sanctions associated with that. Um, however, in terms of um, prohibiting um, third-party funding in jurisdictions such as Ireland. Um, and there has been the case, and um, Joe ha referenced it earlier, where third-party, um, an arbitration award was not enforced as a result of the, f the existence of a funding arrangement for reasons of champerty and maintenance, and a it was really a public policy issue. And we're really looking at the New York Convention, right? Looking backwards, or looking at a very narrow, um, scope in terms of non-enforcement and certainly a public po it, it can be argued as it has been argued um, in the English courts as to the public policy of enforcing arbitration awards trumping a public policy of another another public policy 
um, in the context of um, in, uh, in the context of the English courts, it was um, not enforcing um, penalty clauses, but it could easily also be, you know, a public policy of shampoo and maintenance. Um, in the Singapore courts, there has been an instance prior to the allowance or the abolishment of shampoo and maintenance, whereby um, the courts, um, in a domestic arbitration context, where there is big broader scope for um, not enforcing an arbitration, uh, a non enforcing an arbitration award, whereby the party, where the, by the court, um, stipulated that um, this award was not enforced because of the public policy of um, shampooing and maintenance threatening um, or tending to threaten the um, the natural justice point. Thank you very much, Chian. Yes, I think it's, uh, it's it can be a real risk uh, with the enforcement, for example, in those jurisdictions where there's no regulation. And I think that's maybe one of the arguments uh, why uh, here in Russia we shall need some kind of uh, official position in order to have at least some certainty in regard of uh, consequences of third-party funding for enforcement of foreign arbitral awards rendered, for example, uh, in jurisdictions where it's allowed. Uh, so I'd like to address some questions to Joe now. Uh, so uh, as far as I understand, you referred to some of the uh, HKIC um, uh, points of view on the, on the third-party funding and disclosure. Uh, but what is the impact of TPF on uh, cost awards, on security for costs, and whether I can recover actually uh, the, my costs on TPF. For example, uh, Maxim uh, said that it will cost me uh, 20, 30 million uh, from, from, the, from my claim. Uh, so can I recover, try to recover these costs uh, uh, from the defendant? Is there any position of the institutions in, uh, in this regard? I think the short answer to the impact, on third party, uh, impact of third-party funding on security because is um, limited. Um, at least I think that is the position taken by the Hong Kong arbitration ordinance. Um, and, and that issue was discussed and considered by the Hong Kong Law Reform Commission. But then they decided not to include a provision um, that empowers the tribunal to order security for costs against any third party funder. And I think there is a clear basis for that because the third party funder is not a party to the arbitration agreement. The tribunal doesn't have jurisdiction to do that. Um, and uh, and uh, in our rules revision process, we similarly don't propose to include that provision to empower the tribunal to order security for costs against any third party funder. Um, and in relation to recoverability of the costs of third party funder, um, the HKIC doesn't take any position on that. Um, it is uh, un uh, internally, it is uh, undecided. We have an undecided position on that um, because we recognize that there it is a very controversial issue. There are a lot of different views about it, um, and um, and I think uh, I know that many commentators take the take the view that uh, allowing the, um, a winning party to recover successfully payment to the party fund will substantially and unfairly increase the cost of arbitration, and uh, they take the view that that is really a bargain and trade off between the funding party and the third party funder, and it would be unfair for the losing <coughs> party to 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 pay the cost of that arrangement um, to which it's not a party. Um, but I think if we're, we are only talking about recovery of costs that is directly incurred in an arbitration proceeding, then I think it would possibly be reasonable to expect a tribunal to um, to find that um, you know a funded party's obligation to repay um, the third party funder could be a sufficient basis for the tribunal to order um, that particular cost to be part of the cost of arbitration. So um, we are seeking. Um, views from um, our users as to whether or not we should include a provision that uh, expressly empowers the tribunal to award costs of their body funding. But uh, as far as HKS is concerned, we don't have any position on that at this stage. I have another question. So as far as I understand, you have introduced third body funding in June. And uh, so what's actually the impact uh, on the market? So I think it's uh, half a year past. Uh, how many Founders came to your market. How many, for example, major players are on this uh, on this market, and what do you expect? Uh, how it will dwell further? I think the first. Well, I think the first mover was probably Burford. I think uh, I remember that there was a press release I saw from Burford Capital that announced that um, they set up some sort of presence in Hong Kong, um, 
And then um, I, also, I, I know that also Harbor set up a formal presence um, in, in Hong Kong. So, um, and that was even before um, the Hong Kong government passed the bill um, on third party funding. So, um, so I think the market demand, market reaction to um, the law reform on third party funding in Hong Kong is very strong. And two leading third party funders already um, set up their um, presence um, in Hong Kong. And uh, even though that there are funders who have offices in the region outside of Hong Kong, but I know that they regularly come to Hong Kong and speak to lawyers um, and uh, in-house counsel and also arbitral institutions as well. Um, so I think the demand for the party funding is definitely strong in Hong Kong. Um, and there is a lot of events and seminars that have been organized by various bodies in Hong Kong to talk about this development, <coughs> and including this very panel. Um, so I think it does sort of have some impact in terms of attract more third party funders to come to Hong Kong to raise awareness of uh, third party funding, to uh, talk about the legitimate basis of providing this service and the benefits of having this service. Um, so I think that's the immediate effect that the, the bill has. I mean, just to add, add to that point, I think um, certainly there are quite a few funders um, who have either formal presence or are coming through the region. Um, in terms of actual demand for their services, I would say that there's the need right now is for awareness, um, which is why there is so much discussion um, in in the region. And certainly in Hong Kong and Singapore, it's where most of the discussion is happening. But in fact, um, going to the surrounding jurisdictions like Korea and Japan and China, where that's where many of the parties who engage in arbitration in Hong Kong and Singapore are, are based is probably the next step. And really, then, then after that, really dealing with the mechanics. I mean, certainly the idea of defining third party funding and the existence of the option of, of, of financing your dispute is one matter, but the mechanics and out actually having a dispute and where to go next and that kind of the procedural mechanics and logistics, I think, would be something that um, our region could probably use more of, um, and also alternative fee arrangements. Certainly, we're specifically talking about third-party funding for arbitration because that's what been that has been, that is what has been legislated. But the fact is that Burford opened with insolvency. Um, and that has been going on for a long time now. And there are many other products out there that exist with Burford, with other funders. The fact that there are brokers. There aren't brokers in, in Asia, official ones yet. And so the market is new and I think is curious, but there is, I mean, there is so much more out there um, in the US, in the UK, in Australia, um, that um, the Asian, regions that are now able to do funding could benefit from. Okay, thank you. I, I have one like uh, maybe closing question from me uh, to any of the panelists. Uh, so is it good when the funders are coming uh, to the market because it can lead to the inflation of the litigation and arbitration. So I understand for, for the lawyers it may be good, uh, but on the other hand, it won't it lead to, so in Russian we have such nice word called sutyazhnichestvo, which is I think something like maintenance. So to, uh, to to, to promote litigation just for litigation. So uh, I would say that Russians uh, like to litigate very much, so um, maybe it will make them like it even more. Uh, so to, to, to enjoy this process of not paying for it. <laughs> so, and uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, can it lead to the uh, raising of the uh, fees of the lawyers because the lawyer will uh, come, uh, the, the client will come to the lawyer and will try to make a bargain with him saying I want to, uh, you to work cheaper. He said, no, I won't work. Uh, the, the, uh, the client will say I don't have money and the lawyer will say okay, go to, the, uh, to Maxim. Uh, he has money and he will pay. Uh, so what's your opinion? Is it good or bad for, for market, for the uh, parties, uh, for councils? Let me start. In my opinion, uh, especially for Russia, it's a very good sign that uh, we have uh, TPF. Uh, we, we have uh, we start this industry uh, at the moment. So, uh, because um, sorry, uh, because uh, well, maybe Sutyarstvo 
is, is, is not so good, but uh, we have other examples which are even worse. I mean uh, that uh, when lost uh, judicial system as an institution uh, is not that developed and uh, people still need uh, some um, methods to solve uh, their disputes. So if judicial system doesn't work, then they will apply to bandits or regular uh, and so on. So uh, this is a very good sign that uh, we can actually third parties agreements uh, um, expands the availability of uh, of uh, courts to the one who couldn't afford it by in any cases. So that's a very good sign and uh, it will definitely help economical and uh, growth and uh, growth of uh, modern institutions in Russia. It's working. So I think I think the uh, the reason why uh, the third party funding was like such a boom in industry in in the West and particularly in England, in America, in, in some of the started in the Asian jurisdictions, because of the legal fees, because it's like the, the, the fees are charged by the American lawyers and uh, by solicitors and barristers in England, like just huge, ten or twenty times bigger than lawyers charge in Russia or or in or in some of the European countries. Uh, so, it, I, I, I don't see, I really don't see that Russian lawyers on a particular case in the Russian court would be charging as high a, as the American lawyers uh, in, in their home jurisdiction, like in their home cases. Uh, what I do see uh, is that by reason of various reforms is that a more complicated and uh, sophisticated cases would be coming to the jurisdiction to the Russian jurisdiction, both for the arbitrations and, uh, and, and the litigations as well. So even if the uh, pressure on the lawyers uh, from the clients in terms of like hourly rates, those things, it will remain just the scope of work to, do, to do the, litigate the case in a professional way uh, diligently uh, would take much more time, much more effort, and that's the bulk pay ticket for the client would increase. And I think over time the clients would accept it because uh, uh, over the last couple of decades the, uh, the Russian clients got exposed to litigating and arbitrating cases in, in LCIA or in American courts or in English courts or in Cyprus. So uh, they get in a sense what it takes. It's, they, they see how the, the complexity, they, they see how things may be difficult and, and a lot of workflows uh, which need to be accomplished. And basically, that to some extent would become into the jurisdiction of Russian courts. So, in this sense, I, we certainly be, I, I, I would view it as, as a great plus that we have uh, Russian companies thinking of uh, introducing this uh, third party funding. Maybe also the, the, the Western funds would be looking at the, the Russian clients. Because not, certainly not all of the clients would be able to, to get into the dispute or get out of the dispute which would be a, of, a, of a big magnitude and, and a complicated one. Because it's certainly, not, in my view, it's certainly not for the uh, retail cases. It's not for the ordinary litigation. Uh, it's not just for simple, it's for complicated matters. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, any comments on influence on market? I think this is quite a fun market to have that conversation in some ways because there have, over the last few years, been several Russian-derived cases which would never have found funding in the market as it stands at the moment, but went ahead nevertheless, you know, absent, absent third-party funding. You know, and don't get me wrong, the English bar and the English legal profession is very grateful for it. So um, it's, it's quite interesting for, for in that regard. But I think there is a level of robust analysis that comes, we think, from the third-party funding industry. Um, which means that we don't fund frivolous cases. We don't fund cases that are, you know, bad cases. If nothing else, as I said at the outset, you know, if, if the case loses, we lose our money. It's just, it doesn't make sense for us to invest in, in bad cases. That's how, you know, funds close very quickly. That's how people lose their jobs. I think from my perspective, um, it is a matter of options. Um, the more options, the better. 
Um, and I think, um, at least from the Hong Kong perspective, um, Hong Kong has traditionally been a very open market. Um, um, in the international arbitration market, we have multiple arbitration institutions operating in Hong Kong, and um, I think that's a good thing. Um, and so I, I don't think third-party funding is suitable for all cases, but if there are cases where parties need third-party funding services, I think it would be good to have third-party funders around to respond to the need. Um, so. Thank you. So I think the answer is that uh, maybe uh, good funders who uh, do the good analysis of the cases will encourage uh, the real cases, the good cases, and will help uh, to get away with the uh, cases that, uh, that uh, has no perspective. So I think it's also a positive uh, element. Okay, thank you. Colleagues, uh, do we have any questions from the audience or comments? Yeah, we have. Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just finished my LM in the United States, and I noticed that they discuss a lot the questions of psychology of conflict in terms of uh, third-party funding too. And one of the conference we discussed this issue of uh, biases of arbitrators, and maybe in your experience, did you see such kind of thing that the involvement of third-party funder uh, can be a decisive factor in arbitration when arbitrators see that? Uh, the third party independent professional uh, market player evaluated the case, evaluated the risks, and he got into it and he uh, sponsored this case. Can this influence somehow has some impact on arbitrators when they uh, be biased in terms of uh, it's like such kind of sure thing that this case is so strong uh, that this party was able even to uh, invite, involve third party funder? It's, it's a really interesting topic, that, because I think it cuts very much both ways. And it kind of it does tie in with the issue of disclosure around funding arrangements, whatever else. Because I think some people will view the, the presence of a, of a litigation funder in a case as a, as a good sign for the merits of the claimant, in that it's gone through an objective assessment process. They must have a good case. But I've also heard it the other way that they must be so desperate they had to go to a litigation funder. Um, so I think it does cut both ways, and I, I haven't seen any, any data about actual or, you know, see bias from any arbitrators on this point, but um, I think it depends on the case itself often, and I think it depends on which side you're in. Um, people perceive us as a, as a sign of strength or a sign of weakness, and, you know, they'll try and exploit it either way, and that's why disclosure is such a hot topic, I think. I think this kind of bias is... Um very obviously presses on some very sensitive issues and it does cut both ways, but it certainly exists even with um, with counsel. Like you have sophisticated counsel on one side, will you have a perception as to a better case? And certainly if you're sitting as an arbitrator, wearing your arbitrator hat, even if you have the tendency to think or have an imp impression in that way, the best thing you can do is acknowledge it and wreck and fight against that particular bias and understand your role is to render an enforceable award. So you still have to write a reasoned award and you still have to be able to justify like, I mean, not to say that you're gonna lean towards that direction, but the reality is that you have your reputation on the line and then you have to render an enforceable award. And so those two points I think keep you hopefully from from falling a, a, you know, a foul from these unconscious biases. Thank you. Any more questions? No? Oh, yeah, we have one. <laughs> Natasha. Uh, thank you. Maybe just a tiny question. In the beginning, it was told that actually third-party funding is, is also uh, can also be used in mediation. And I just wanted, I was just wondering whether it's actually widespread because just in my point of view, it wouldn't be really profitable for a third party because uh, in mediation cases, we don't have like real amount in action because nobody knows what the outcome is, will actually be. So I just was wondering what's uh, the opinion of those uh, who had some experiences as an arbitral institutions, whether these cases can actually be so third party funding of mediation and those who are actually funders, whether it's actually can, whether it's just theoretical possibility or it's really like somebody is funding that. Thank you. Um, 
we don't or haven't, I don't think, funded any mediation cases, purely for mediation cases. Uh, people may be out there doing it, they may consider it, I think, in due course, but you know, there's, there's various issues, some of which you, you hit on, um, why it's potentially not a great investment. Um, I think that will determine how, it's, how, it, how it goes down in the market. I haven't seen that in uh, mediation cases either at the HKIC, and, uh, and I, I can see um, your point of um, sort of securing what's, what's the, whether or not it, it makes sense to seek third party funding um, in an independent mediation um, case. But what has been contemplated by the arbitration ordinance in Hong Kong is to cover arbitration and uh, associated mediation proceedings. So the, the, the arbitration ordinance does not deal with um, third party funding in the independent mediation proceedings. And I think the approach that has been taken by the Hong Kong arbitration ordinance makes sense because, for example, if you have a mediation arbitration combination process, um, then um, it would make sense to legalize or recognize third party funding throughout the whole process. Otherwise, if you just recognize the party funding arbitration, then what if the parties suspend arbitration and go to mediation, and then depending on the outcome of mediation, they come back to arbitration, and then there is a period of a time during the whole process, i.e. mediation, the third party funding arrangement would not be legal. So that doesn't make any practical sense. I think from that perspective, it makes sense to extend um, the, um, the the legality of the party funding to cover any associated proceedings in Hong Kong. I think that's the rationale behind it. Those actually two last questions prompted another question from me. Is uh, I, I'm, I'm less concerned about the biases of the uh, of the arbitrators when they, they get to know that the claimant has a third party funder. But Michael, in your experience, uh, does it actually affect the respondent's perspective of the case? So does this then prompt settlement talks? So how often, in your experience, the fact that when, Barford, when the Barford standing behind the claimant and that is disclosed, uh, how often it leads to a settlement? Um, I suppose the, the most straightforward answer is we don't know. Um, you know. There may be settlement discussions that are prompted as soon as these, these things come out, but it's hard to say that it's because these things come out. But on average, like, despite the disclosure, so how many, like in your experience? Uh, it doesn't happen that often um, in terms of pure, you know, amount of time that passes between disclosure and, and, and settlement. It doesn't happen that often. I guess because by the time we invest in a case, the positions are so entrenched anyway, that they're not going to back down that easy. Um, very often it comes purely because they've, you know, ventilated all of their issues in front of, you know, independent people and actually it's their case which is no longer looking that good, um, or not, I guess. Because what the Chiang mentioned is that when it's like bringing a, a barrister in a case, because with some of the clients what we found useful in, in, in Russian cases, especially if the, we, like both sides know how much it would cost to go into the full cycle of the arbitration. If they really just disagree about the interpretation of the English law government contract, what we found help us okay, on go to a QC, ask their his opinion. If you bring it on the table, that may have uh, some of kind of a negotiation uh, tool. So that, because uh, the way to portray it is that, look, if you go to the LCA arbitration, there will be like one or three QCs appointed. These guys go to the same law schools, they, they like educated the same way. It's likely that the three other guys would look at the case the same way. So that, that has some influence. But the, and, and that, that approach, when, when it's a fair disagreement, because if someone of the parties is, is do it for other reasons, so it's not a fair disagreement, it just takes some time, then it's not going to work. So that's, in this sense, uh, really like, but I understand, when, when, you're, when the funding is disclosed in the middle of the way, it, the parties already start in a dispute, so yeah. they already raise the stakes. And I think what you probably tend not to see very often is funded cases being handled in that kind of way, where you've got the top QC or the top QCs kind of tag teaming in and out of, <laughs> of uh, cross examination and you know the, the seas of lawyers behind it. Probably you see more moderation in a funded case um, because that's what we want. I mean, the case is still the case. So you probably see less often in a funded case that thing of people bringing you know, a gun to a knife fight, to put it in those kind of terms. Thank you very much. Uh, so I suggest that uh, we can continue some questions and answers by a glass of champagne. Uh, okay. 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 Uh, 
uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to uh, to make a question. Uh, this is uh, my question is for the Russian part of the panel. Um, I don't want to criticize the model of litigation for party funding in Russia, but anyway, uh, taking into account that we have in Russia so a highly developed market of contingency fee. Uh, lawyers, so how will it work in Russia, in your opinion, uh, in case you uh, you're a client and you have a strong case, you will most probably find a contingency fee lawyer who will uh, take the case for the contingency fee, uh, and um, in, so you will not need to attract uh, the investment. Uh, and in case if you fail to find uh, the contingency fee lawyer, that will, uh, that will be obviously uh, the red, the red uh, mark for the potential investor. So uh, does this model uh, have, a, have a poten any potential in Russia? I mean litigation uh, funding. Thank you. Um, I think with, with litigation funding and for the Russian cases, and that's where I started from, like I met, met, met most of the cases, they are not suitable. Because compared, like Russian case, an average one, compared to an average in England, it's done much faster. Uh, it's true that the litigation in Russia is much more efficient than arbitration. But, that's with a big but, uh, if we speak about a set of proceedings, some of, like, some of in which your law firm is involved, for example, uh, and which may go for years, and uh, that's the way it works. There may be some good prospects at the end, uh, but they are like three, four, five years after. Uh, law firms may differ in, in size, and uh, they may have limited financial resources themselves. It's like you and I, we would go, we want to get our salary twice a, twice a month. I don't, personally, I don't want to work on a contingency. As a firm, it's a good, nice thing, but my boss would have to pay the money uh, twice a month. And uh, if the client doesn't have the money, the law firm is, doesn't have the money either to invest. Because it's a sense, it's not a time investing, but for someone it's also the money investing. So that, those kind of cases, those kind of uh, what we call stories, may be appropriate, subject to that at the end there are assets which can be attached now, so like two or three years from now they're still available for the recovery. So those th and. and then they may be also multi-jurisdictional because uh, some of the cases our firm work on, there is a, an arbitration in London and there are parallel proceedings in, in Russian courts and in courts in other jurisdictions. So those kind of a big things uh, may well require funding and, 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 and they may be presented to the funders and, and the clients may be advised about the, the funding being available. Absolutely, we agree with Yuri, and I also would like to add that um, uh, that's a completely different risk. Of course, there are lawyers with an, an, an entrepreneurial spirit who want to take additional risks for additional money, but uh, w w my familiar lawyers, well, I, I don't remember except the one in the mirror uh, who would uh, gladly get those risks without any fixed sum. So the, the usual f uh, picture is, uh, of course, we would like uh, to have a contingency fee, but we also like to have a fixed sum with this. Uh, I know very few people who would easily get rid of a uh, fixed sum for only contingency. And what actually uh, uh, litigation funding offers is to get rid of all the risks f related to finance because we take them. It's, so, of course, if you have uh, needed expertise, if you have uh, entrepreneurial passion, uh, you, you are probably the one who would replace a third party in this case. But there are very few people I see in Russia. And by the way, there are also, as far as I know, there are several difficulties in enforcing uh, agreements related to contingency fees in uh, our cause. So that's another risk. Thank you very much. Uh, so I would like to uh, say thank you very much uh, to all our speakers. Uh, I think you really did this uh, event uh, discussion on arbitration in comparative perspective. And I think that now we have a very interesting uh, understanding of, uh, of third party funding. So anyone can 
uh, go further and study this task force report. Uh, I think it's uh, a lot of interesting things to find there. Uh, and uh, so we will look further to have other hot topics uh, for our further events. So please stay tuned and follow us on uh, on our social networks, our website. Uh, I would like to say thank you very much also to the uh, team of uh, International and Comparative Law Research Center who hosted and arranged this event. I would like to say thank you very much to the whole uh, team of Arbitration Center at the Institute of Modern Arbitration. I would like to say a special thank you to our colleague from Arbitration Center, Ilyana Burova, who has a birthday today and who actually spends this birthday with us. <laughs> and. Uh, did much to prepare these questions for this uh, interesting topic. Uh, thanks and congratulations. Happy birthday. And uh, now I invite all of you to enjoy uh, this evening and to discuss uh, interesting topics together by the glass of champagne. Thank you.